cats and dogs living together. <laughs> oh, it's hard to follow. Hard to follow this introduction, so I'll, I'll try. Um, so in this talk, we want to talk about how to build uh, web, web services using .NET Core and Entity Framework Core that run on many platforms. So just to give me an idea, when I say .NET Core, how many people don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, so I'll, it's, it's like, I don't want you guys to be here till like midnight. So I'm going to try to go like at a reasonable pace. But if I lose somebody, just raise your hand and we'll uh, back up a little bit. So first of all, we need to, I guess, have an understanding of what .NET Core is. So how many people heard of .NET period, Microsoft .NET or .NET Framework? So that's the framework that came out in early 2000s for building applications that run on Windows and they support desktop apps using WinForm technology or WPF and web apps using ASP.NET or uh, MVC in a further incarnation. So it kind of covers a multitude of apps you can build, but it was Windows specific. .NET Core is the new incarnation of a platform level framework that lets you build almost any app that is also written by Microsoft but runs on both uh, Linux and Windows so it's not specific to Windows as the old one used to be. One thing that came along with it or slightly after it was announced, put it this way, is a net standard or .NET standard. And that's the way that Microsoft decided to unify APIs across all those platforms. So if you think about .NET Framework, if you know Java, you know there is a JVM, Java Virtual Machine, and as you build Java apps, they run that VM. So .NET was the same way. There is a .NET runtime, and your apps run on that runtime. So .NET Standard is completely opposite approach. So instead of providing a VM, they provide a standard that they can implement the runtime on different platform using native code. So there is no quote-unquote virtual machine that sits between your code and operating system, whatever operating system that is. Instead, you have this uh, layer, this abstraction layer that implements all native APIs, all the APIs that .NET code needs on the native platform, with a native platform code. So net standard is the way to say, Here's our standard. And if you say you want to support .NET Core on whatever your platform is, you have to implement those API defined by the standard. So they kind of put .NET Framework upside down. So instead of saying, this is what virtual machine supports, you say, if you want to be this virtual machine, this is what you have to implement. So it's much more open and at the same time, you don't remove the dictatorship from there. So you try to force everybody to write the same way. Because we need tooling. So we'll look at Visual Studio as one of the tooling. So the tooling is part of .NET Core. So it ships with the utilities that run, again, cross-platform utilities. You can run them on Linux, Mac, uh, or Windows. So we talked about that it's cross-platform. It's much, much more performant. So they rewrote it with performance in mind. So presumably it's much faster according to Microsoft own stats. Uh, they're in like near top 10 of all frameworks that are used to build web applications. They used to be like way down with .NET full framework. .NET Core moved them into top 10. I think they're like eight or nine, somewhere in that general area. They used to be higher, but as they added features from 1.0 to 2.0, they dropped down a little bit because those features require some uh, CPU cycles to function. But it's still way fast. I think they process like half a million requests to static content per sec. Uh, and they used to be more like 40,000, I think, at some point. Uh, .NET Framework used to be deployed to a Windows machine, and all apps that deploy to that machine use that framework. 
Now you deploy the version of .NET Core with your app. So whatever your app needs, you deploy with it. You don't interfere with any other apps that run on the same machine. So it's a lot more flexible. And when somebody installs Windows Update, it's not going to break your app. They also made it a lot more modular. So beforehand, when you install .NET Framework, it's a 60 megabyte file, and it installs the whole thing. So now you can pick and choose. On one hand, it's much more convenient. Your app is smaller. Uh, and the memory footprint is small. On the other hand, it could be a little painful for you to find the stuff you need. So we'll see how we can get around that. And of course, the, from a language perspective, it's the same language as you used to use. It's a C sharp, it's VB, and I think F sharp now as well. So those are uh, languages that compile to .NET Core. Uh, but just like people wrote languages to run on full .NET framework that compile to .NET runtime, probably people will come up with other languages uh, or a compiler, more specifically, that will produce .NET Core. But we'll see. And one of the important parts, uh, instead of doing a proprietary work uh, behind the tall walls, now it's all in the open. So the code lives on GitHub, and anybody can go see what code they wrote to make it all work. So it's completely in the open, including the roadmap is in the open. The advantage kind of that is, First of all, you have more smart people contributing from the community. And two, uh, even if Microsoft goes out of business, which will never happen, but say it could, the code is still there, right? So people can pick it up and go for it. So one thing to mention is Net Standard 2.0, which is maybe like two months old or so. Uh, uh, .NET Core was released, I want to say, a little over a year, version one. So 2.0 was two months ago or so. And what they did, they backfilled the API. So whatever typical .NET APIs people used to use, 1.0 or 1.1 didn't have that kind of a stack. So if you try to build a real world app, it would be really hard because you'll be missing methods that you are accustomed to. So 2.0 is that kind of release. It's backfilled the API to the point where most people can write most apps. That's kind of what the goal. Uh, <clears throat> so, tooling, of course, you can pick your choice. You can use Visual Studio. There's a Visual Studio for Mac, which is used to be Xamarin Studio, but now it's Visual Studio for Mac with added support for .NET Core. And you can do Visual Studio Code. I don't remember exactly what plugins you need to install that support C Sharp as a language. And you can use the code editor versus an IDE or integrated development environment. It's a little lighter weight, but also has fewer features. So I'm going to use Visual Studio, but I wanted to mention that other, other editors work. Now, besides that type of tooling, there's a tooling that does your basic task. Like there has to be something that compiles your software. And it has to be things that compiles your program and builds your project. And they'll let you add package reference and all that. So there is a utility called .NET that ships when you install .NET SDK, or right now it's installed as part of Visual Studio as long as you check the check mark. And that puts in the tooling, and the tooling is really .NET EXE, and it does a whole variety of your basic tasks. And we can drop down to command line and take a quick look at that. So I can type .NET, that runs the EXE, and basic commands I think will be shown if you do minus minus help, uh, which is the standard. So if you ever get lost in .NET command line, minus minus help will bring you back and give you a list of stuff you need to know. So you'll see some of the basic commands and the structure is always the same. So anytime you do command, it's always .NET, exe, then command name, then parameters and any options. So no matter what command you use, the structure of it is always the same. So I say there is a new command. So I can type new, do minus minus help on that, and then it'll give me the help for the new command. And as you can see, it has uh, some parameters in here. And it says .NET new, what type of project you want to create, and any additional options for that specific command. So I wanted to kind of take a, a brief overview of 
.NET EXE before we jump in. And then uh, key commands, we talked about things like create new, build, run, add the reference or add package. Those are basic things. So you'll get lost, here's the URL. You know, that's a documentation. While we're at it, docs.microsoft.com also contains all other documentation about .NET Core. So if you want to go to one place, find your getting started kind of guide. It's a lot better than what it used to be, although now it's harder to find deeper concepts in there. But anything basic, like 80-20 rule, they should cover about 80% of your questions. Now, what stuff we can build? Now that we're into .NET standard, .NET standard. Uh, we can build apps. So obviously, web apps is what we're going to work on today. And you can build web services, but also web applications using MVC framework, which is kind of a uh, model view controller framework, meaning that you have some way to generate views, some way to marry those views to back services or controllers that perform actions. So that type of structure is what MVC is and they support Razor syntax only right now, which is pro proprietary, so to speak, language that lets you create views. So we're not going to look at that today, but I wanted to mention it. And then you can do mobile application. Now, because, uh, probably because, Microsoft bought Xamarin, which is a cross-platform framework that lets you build iOS apps and Android apps using C Sharp. They also going to implement, they also already technically implemented Net Standard 2.0. Now you can write, create a library that targets .NET Standard, reference that library from iOS project, and now your Net Standard code can run on iOS device. So if you, when I heard that, mind blown right there. Um, and that's coming to IoT apps as well, meaning that the Windows IoT Core, which is an operating system that Microsoft puts out for free that will run on small devices. I think it's limited by size or screen size uh, and it's free. For example, you can download that version, run it on Raspberry Pi, create a project that targets net standard, push it to a Raspberry Pi. Now you run in your C Sharp app on Raspberry Pi using a version of Windows 10 targeted to that small device. So two, two kinds of apps. Now, any questions? We got a little fast. Yes. It used to be that you had to create multiple projects for um, um, Mac applications and Android applications and Windows applications. Is this still the case? Yeah. So the starting endpoint, you still need that app. But then you can create net standard library in the same project and reference it from all of those projects. So you can share code via net standard library versus things like linked files or shared projects. This way you can create a library. Uh, you may run into issues. I know we've run into an issue where we wanted to use a third party Xamarin library and they don't support net standard. So as soon as we added that reference, the whole solution stopped compiling. So you'll, you can run into some edge case. At that point, you have to revert back to like shared projects or um, uh, the old style PC, PCL parallel, uh, not parallel, but uh, uh, cross-platform class libraries. So you can switch back. But if you're not using some third-party stuff, you can stick to that standard right now to build your Xamarin project that runs and targets both iOS and uh, Android. And again, it's because Xamarin, comp well, Microsoft now, they implement a net standard in that runtime. So they provide a set of APIs that you can just use and not worry about how they natively implement it on Android platform or iOS platform because it's a net standard is what drives it. So people say Xamarin Studio blah is compatible with net standard 2.0. You're done. Nothing else to worry about. Question.
does it mean that we were happy we were now suddenly about that next that next fall? Probably not, I would say 80% of the time. To me, it's like 80, 20 rules. So whatever you know right now, but building web apps, say using MVC and web API, I would say at least 80%, maybe even 90% of that skill set is directly transferred. There's nothing really new to learn uh, on day-to-day -day code. There are new things when you create projects and compiling and deployment and all that. But you don't do that every day. You set it up once and you're done. Code you write day to day, you're probably good almost all the time. Your skill set is just directly transferred. So the, the big advantage now uh, on that next is just building lighter uh, in size uh, applications? Is that, is that when it comes to web apps, they'll, they'll be faster and you can deploy them to Linux. So if those two things are important to you, then it makes sense to you to migrate maybe to that or even or start greenfield apps using .NET Core, assuming that it does everything you want to do. So 2.0 was a huge release when they added tens of thousands of APIs. But if you try to convert an app that was written, say, 15 years ago, you may run into edge cases, depending on what that app does, that you won't be able to accommodate. Like there's still things like COM is gone. There's no COM on, uh, on, on Linux, obviously. So if you ever use like P-Invoke, which I know some people do, there's nothing you can do with that code. That won't convert. You'll have to figure something else out. And <coughs> directory services, meaning integrating with Active Directory is not quite there and system the drawing is not there. So you can run into some edge cases where you exist an app you can't just convert because then you're gonna lose functionality. But again, I would say, I can almost guarantee that 80% of it will just compile and run. Because even though there's new APIs, but nobody wrote, rewrote, you know, string.substring. Like it's still string.substring, right? So there's not, nothing to change there. It'll just compile and it'll just run without you having to make any code change. But that's not gonna be 100% of the time, for sure. So it kinda depends what your old code does. But the new code, I feel like, if you don't run into edge cases, there is no reason to build, no, there's no reason not to build it on that network. There's no good reason for it. That's how I would phrase it. So that's how Microsoft positions 2.0, is like most people can build most steps without any issue. So there will be more, there will be 2.1 probably and 3.0, and they're gonna bring in some things that they feel are useful uh, from .NET, full .NET framework into .NET Core. Things that they can implement that could be supported on all platforms, like directory services. There is no active directory on Linux, at least not today, right? But maybe on the Linux, you wanna hit Azure Active Directory, so you need something. So that kind of remains to be seen but for the most part, you should be okay building apps today. There's no reason to wait, in my opinion, anyway. There's no reason to wait. So we talked about .NET Core. I want to mention a couple of things about other components that we're going to use today. So there is EF Core or Entity Framework Core, which is an ORM tool, object relational mapping tool, that lets you write code that works against database, but it looks like objects standard objects like c sharp objects so that's what the ef core is we're going to do a couple of slides on that nothing really changed you still have this abstraction layer so you have database abstractions which is db context and the table abstractions which is a db set uh, you can evolve your database structure via features called migrations that's still there just like it was uh, it abstracts stuff from the actual implementation via provider concept, meaning that Entity Framework doesn't need to change to support DB2, just IBM needs to write a provider that understands, implements a specific provider interface and can convert C Sharp to DB2 SQL. So DB context is kind of does a few things. Uh, it may, does state maintenance, it, it has uh, uh, update APIs that flushes the changes out. Um, 
and you have some additional access to various database specific features. DBSet, as like I mentioned, it's a table, so it contains structured data in terms of rows and columns. And again, link is still there in .NET Core, so you can write your nice C-sharp uh, language integrated query code that will convert your code to the actual SQL queries. And migrations, of course, you write C-sharp code. Some things got removed that used to be there, but for the most part, it works. Uh, now we're jumping into .NET Core, more specifically ASP.NET Core, and you want to implement some validations. That technology called data annotations or attributes that you decorate your properties and classes with, that provides automatic validation, those work in both Entity Framework Core and ASP.NET Core. Uh, we talked about async code. Really, the recommendation in my mind right now is always write async code when you write web apps. There's no reason not to, and you get scalability out of it at the expense of slightly slower performance. But if your focus is money, scalability is more important than performance because you can run cheaper, say, on Azure that was mentioned, or Amazon, or Google Cloud. You can run .NET Core apps anywhere at this point, and if your app scales better, it'll be cheaper for you to run. So async code through and through is probably the good idea uh, to start with. Quest. Um, the entity framework part, um, does, this do, does this support um, VMX and no. first? You know, there's no EDMX, and the DMX is not coming back either. It's a code-only framework. So there is no tool, there is no XML. Uh, you write classes which convert to your tables, represent tables, loosely speaking. And you write your DB context, which corresponds to your database. You do your own annotations. And you do your own annotations, or you can configure them in code. It's whatever, so to speak, floats your boat, whatever you like more, or whatever makes more sense to you. I'm going to use encode configuration, because it kind of, in my mind, keeps models more pristine and your validation that is UI specific doesn't bleed into table structure configuration could become meh, a little bit messy, but you could certainly use either one. Okay. Last question. Shoot. If someone was brave enough to actually write their own DMX file, would it actually be able to load it? No. Okay. There's no EDMX support whatsoever. None. So the, the thing that and as far as I know, nobody's asking for that, but some people are asking for visualization. Because you could open EDMX in a studio and you can visualize your model. So people sort of asking for a way to visualize. There is no way to visualize your model. That part is a, a little annoying. And at some point, somebody's going to write it, or Microsoft will write it, because it is kind of important. Now, Web API is very similar to what Web API is today. It's almost identical uh, API surface as far as methods and how it functions at a high level, and even most attributes are the same. But it looks a little cleaner, some of the code uh, that was kind of duplicated, like it, you had route prefix and route attribute, and you always have to remember which one you put where. So there is some unification of API, some cleanup, but for the most part, if you know Web API and you have API controller class, uh, almost the same code will work. And chances are it'll probably even compile. Uh, one thing that they did do is removed the mandatory inheritance. So it, it used to only work if you inherit from API controller. Right now you don't have to do that anymore. So you can create like a POCO class with a few methods and it's just automatic web service. Like there's nothing extra you need to do to convert a C-sharp class or VB.net class into a web service. So it's really, I feel like, clean or abstraction all around. And it's more driven by conventions and a little less by configuration, also, although those are still available. So you think of uh, Web API as classes that have methods and classes you think is a web service and a method is like your web method 
So that's kind of kind of think about, it. and and they're called actions. You know, methods are called actions. Uh, and of course, dependency injection, which one could argue was a little bit of an afterthought in MVC and Web API, but now it's in the foreground, and it ships with a default DI, default inversion of control container. Again, if I'm losing somebody, wave. And so it allows you to write code that is much more testable. So you kind of write your class, you, you put whatever you want in the constructor, and then you just trust the framework will figure all that out and create the instances you need when your controller is invoked. So you write cleaner code, more testable code, you can mock all those dependencies and test them more isolation. Even entity framework core DB context has become an injectable, used to not be. So you have to figure something else out. But now you can inject DB context itself. We'll see that. Uh, so there's whole, all the conventions are for the most part still there. The route templates, action templates, method templates, like the actual URL at which your method is invoked for this, the same. Okay. All right, so now it's time to write some code. So I'm going to pause for a minute and ask for questions. And seriously, if, if I'm saying something, acronym or Russian word, just raise your hand <laughs> and I'll, I'll, well, we'll circle back around and I'll, I'll do my best to explain. So does it make sense at the whole? Hopefully it makes more sense with code. So I'm going to write in C sharp. So how many people have never seen C sharp in their life? How about Java? Have you seen Java? Yeah. Okay. You're good. It'll be similar. <laughs> if that fails, I'm going to say JavaScript. You've seen that? That's also similar. So let's start. Uh, I'm going to clear my console here. I'm going to jump to Studio. All right. Can everybody see from the back? It's not too small? Okay. All right, so we're going to start, we're going to build a web services project that's going to use Entity Framework to access the data, and we're going to implement a few basic CRUD operations. That's probably going to take an hour, and then we can decide where we want to go from there. Um, and I'll be copy-pasting some code that is a little lengthy and typing some of it that is a little shorter. Um, so. Already? Okay. And there was much excitement. So we're going to start with a new project. Uh, if you install Visual Studio, I'm using actually Community Edition, which is, I should mention, it's free. And you don't need to give Microsoft any money. And the features that are missing are few and far between that you probably will not need anyway. So you can download free Community Edition runs on any Windows machine. Uh, there's nothing you need to do. You probably want to sign up what they call like a development account, which is also free. And at that point, you can download some additional stuff. I'm using SQL Server Developer Edition, which is like full-blown SQL Server development. If you sign up for development accounts, you can get that for free too. So that's my entire environment. It's a Windows SQL Server Development Edition and Visual Studio Community Edition all free, you just have to sign up for Microsoft account and develop an account and, you, and you're done. So now I'm going to put the project somewhere else um, and we're going to call it ggmag because why not? Ah, there we go. So we're going to say ASP.NET Core. Now the next dialog, you'll have some options, what kind of projects you want to create. So we can create MVC app, which I mentioned, which is a user interface. That's how you build web apps with controls and save buttons and whatever other stuff. So we're going to skip that. There is some time at the end. We can look at that a little bit too. Empty one has no code at all, which would may force me to write a lot more code. So I'm picking a web API because that's what we're working on. I could also set up authentication in there. So if I want to use like third-party authentication provider or 
.NET Core identity, which is your basic, basic authentication routines that live in your entity framework database. That's where you can store users and passwords and that kind of crap, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so uh, I'll skip that for now. So I'm kind of skipping authentication. It's fairly trivial to implement that. So if you remind me, we'll, we'll see that. So first thing we want to do, depending on what version of Studio you download and install, it may or may not default to .NET Core 2.0, which is what we want to do. So before we do anything else, we're going to change the target of my project to .NET Core. So I could also install, create a new project here if I wanted to. And this time, I can do .NET Standard. And I can do that. And then I can go to my uh, dependencies on my ggmog and add a reference to class library. And now, hopefully it'll compile. We'll see that in a minute. So I'm going to switch to project. I'm going to call the ggmog. And then my actual web project is in another ggmog. So this is a solution folder. And this is the project folder right now. I have two projects in my solution. Yes? Can you go back to how you changed it to the 2.0? OK, so if I go to properties of created project, there is a target in there. And I'm changing that, make that a little bigger, to .NET Core 2.0. Because this is like, this is a .NET standard project. This is an ASP.NET Core project. So I'm just telling, I'm just telling it's going to run on .NET Core framework. But the library I can create as .NET standard, and I can do things like, now I'm going to create, say, I don't know, Xamarin project, and reference exact same library. And so there's some advantages to that. I just wanted to kind of simulate that. So the couple of things I want to do. Uh, is edit that project and change a couple of things. So as you can see, some things that got added, Application Insights, which uh, Jared mentioned. App Insights is a Microsoft technology that can log all of your information about running an app, like performance and errors and all kind of other stuff into Microsoft App Insights Cloud. And so you have a centralized location where you can see what's going on with your app. So by default, they add that. And then they had ASP.NET Core and MVC, which are two key libraries. But as you can see, I don't have things like Entity Framework, which is what I use. I probably don't have all the login that I want to use. So that is, becomes a little bit annoying. So instead, what I'm going to do is add something called ASP Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.all. So .all is like a meta pack. So I, I mentioned modular approach. So like MVC is a package and core is a package. Hard to remember all that. So they created this all meta package. If I install that, it downloads every assembly that is in, in ASP.NET Core and they're available in my project. That does not blow, however, your final build solution because they will skip all the assemblies that aren't referenced when they build your final solution. So this is a convenient thing for development, but doesn't affect final product. So I just always reference that because the, the other stuff is just annoying. So now there's one more thing I want to do in this project. And this next thing is not supported right now through UI. So one thing I could have done with this, uh, when I added the item group, I could have gone here, manage NuGet packages, and search for ASP.NetCore.all and edit this way. Well, I mistyped it, but I could have done it. But if you know what it's called, I find that it's easier just to edit project directly. This thing is tooling. So the Manage NuGet Packages UI does not support tooling NuGet Packages. Maybe it will one day, not today. So a couple of things that I want to do, 
One is Razor support, which is MVC code generation two. Then there is a .NET Watcher. A .NET Watcher is a super convenient thing. Uh, you can start that Watcher from command line, and then you can make changes and not compile your app. So Watcher watches for code changes, automatically compiles your app. You can let it run in the background, just refresh uh, browser, and you have your new code there. So convenient thing. And there is Entity Framework 2, which is the uh, command line utility specific to .NET uh, Entity Framework Core that lets you do things like migrations and other crap, other stuff. <laughs> habit, habit. So now what I can do is restore those packages. So I can do .NET restore. So we drop in a little bit to command line. Ordinarily, we would need to do it a whole lot. But things like restore is a little bit faster, I feel like doing it from command line. Now we want to build it. So we can do build all, or we can skip build and do straight to run. And .NET run will build and run our app. So this is the first test to make sure stuff is set up right, all my references is right, and things will hopefully just work. So it's running on this weird port number. Uh, and I can hit it, but I'm just going to skip it for now. So we know that things compile, which is a nice first step. So first thing I want to do is change that port number. So there is a secret file over here. Uh, no, right here. Launch set in JSON. And this one tells you what port to run on. And I will change it because uh, I'm running Postman and I already have some code, some tests set up in it. And I don't want to retype a new port number. So this launch set in JSON file lets you control things like what port are you going to run under when you launch from <coughs> command line or when you launch from here. So one thing to mention, I launched it from command line, but I could also launch it from here using IAS Express, for example. So I can run that. <coughs> that will stand up my application in IAS Express, my web service. <coughs> Uh, but it will still use .NET Core web server called Kestrel. So fundamentally, there is no IIS anymore. I forgot to mention it. So if you wrote Microsoft-based web apps, you know they used to run in IIS. Now they run a new web server called Kestrel. You can still deploy to IIS, but all IIS is going to do is forward all the calls. It literally does no work. So the, it forwards all calls to Kestrel, you will see a little bit of a performance thing in there. So it actually ran as well. So it compiled and it ran. Now I'm going to do one other thing, which is I'm going to stop it. I'm going to switch back. And I'm going to type .NET watch, .NET watch run. So this is that watcher tool that we installed. I'm going to run that in the background. Now I need to compile and now I need to flip back. So this is kind of set up my dev environment, and I'm ready to write some actual code. So we'll wait for it to come up. Now it's on port 5000. If I flip back to uh, Chrome over here, uh, and I'm going to go HTTP, uh, localhost, host port 5000, hopefully that will still work or not. Yeah, that does not like properly redirect back. We'll come back to it. We'll write some code. We'll come back. So because it oh, should. At I know. that's probably not good. I'm 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 guessing that's not good. Because this is not code, I'm going to restart it, and then we'll see if it works. To typos are not good, but because it was not in a code file, it was configuration file, nothing really caught it. Still no love, but we'll see. But the call came in, so we can see in the command line that the ASP.NET Core hosting actually caught it and responded with something. So we can do a thing slash API 
slash values, which we don't have automatic redirect anymore, and there is nothing at the root. So now API slash value returns something. So now we know that this stuff works, and we can actually see that it returns something in 0 0.2 seconds. Now we can jump back and write some code. I'm going to close all documents. And first thing we want to talk about is the startup process. So startup process, as you can see, the program.cs with static void main. More importantly, if we, if, I don't know if people missed it or not, but output type of this thing is actually console applications, which is kind of interesting. So if we look here, what choices we have is just library or console app, or if I'm building for Windows. So web app is now console app, which is kind of strange. So this is a startup or an entry point into my software. And as you can see what I'm doing there, I'm using Castrell, which is um, .NET Core web service. And then I'm supporting IS deployment, so which is what use IS integration is. And then more importantly, there is a use startup called startup. And that's what we're interested in. So this is our startup class. That's where it's configured. And if I look at my startup class, I see a little bit of code in here that we want to uh, go over. So one is configuration. So in ASP.NET Core specifically, instead of web config, now you have as a standard, although you could use web config if you want to, but as a standard, we switch to JSON-based files. So in a startup, we want to suck in configuration. So a couple of things we do. We want to look from the folder I'm running from. Then I'm going to find in that folder, I'm going to find uh, configuration file called appsettings.json. And it actually supports live reload, just like web config supports kind of live reload. And then I'm going to add any additional file. So if I'm running in production, I can also optionally pull in appsettings.production.json. This environment name is the name that is set up. It's like environmental variable that says I'm running production mode or dev mode. And then I can also add uh, <coughs> environmental variables, and then I just build it. And so build creates this configuration root, which essentially is dictionary of all of your configurations. And if we look at AppSettings JSON file, we will see there is not a whole lot of configuration in here now, just uh, login. And if I want to do to add that some more to it, I have app settings, I have a, a connection string, and I'll go ahead and add that. So this is how you add settings to JSON. What your, what your names are, it doesn't really matter at all. So whatever you want to call. So connection strings, default connections, more or less what we're stuck in with. And as you can see, I'm running against SQL Server, and I'm running against uh, ggmog database right now. I'm going to start SQL Server for future use. So this is how configuration files are sucked in and made available to the running code through this I configuration route. Now that we're done with that, there are a couple of entry points that we have here in the startup. There is configure services and configure. So what configure services does, it lets you uh, add via dependency injection all of your injectable services. So by default, uh, because it's an MVC app or Web API, forgot to mention, well, Web API and MVC, if you ever use the old one, they now merge. This is all just called MVC. Maybe not the most descriptive way, uh, name for web services, but it kind of works because they're still controllers. So there are no views. But if you squint, it sort of like there. And so in this configure, uh, in this configure services, I'm going to add my other injectable. So right now I have MVC, but since we're going to use Entity Framework, I'm going to add Entity Framework to it as well. So I'm just going to delete in here and paste this thing in. Uh, MVC has some additional options. Uh, the one I'm adding is the JSON configuration. And I'm doing this purely for demo purposes. So 
Uh, if I have an entity framework, I have two tables that are related, meaning that I have, say, person, and it has a person type in it, and person type object has a list of people. If you try to serialize that, the JSON serializer will complain. So this is a quick fix for that. So in a real app, I don't know if you would use that or not. But as you're practicing, it becomes convenient and avoids all kind of errors. Now, in addition to that, I want to configure entity framework. For that, if you remember DB context, which is my database abstraction, so I want to set up one DB context. I'm going to have one database. And so I'm going to add that. So first thing I want to do is create my DB context, right? So something, so for, for what just popped up, you, like a few years ago, you needed resharper or nothing would work. Uh, now Entity Frame, uh, Visual Studio has a lot more features. So I could create uh, some code and just start typing it and then go back and say, oh, this class is missing, I'm gonna fix it. So may or may not do perfect work in here, but it'll get you pretty far. So in this case, I'm gonna inherit from DB context which is the base class from Entity Framework. And I'm going to add the reference. And now this first line should stop complaining. Now use SQL Server, that comes from another namespace. So the only thing I need to do is add the namespace. And here's why my configuration just came in. I'm not sure if it was obvious. It, it's kind of weird, dotted, you know, dotted syntax, it uses the colon. And if you look at App State in JSON, the colon is this one. So it becomes your class JSON object boundary separator goes in as a dictionary. So what I'm referring to is connection strings default connection. I'm starting with a root. At the root, I have just nothing but properties. My first property is connection strings right here. And then at that one, I have another JSON object with one property called default connection and I add it separated by a column. So this, so you can go as many levels deep as you want, but this is how you make sense of your configuration uh, as you use it. Couple of things that I added here, a couple of lines of code illustrate a couple of things about Entity Framework Core that are not in Entity Framework. For example, batch updates. In other words, if you add, say, you know, 10 person records, and then you say, say, it used to be there are five distinct queries going to the back end. And so right now you're going to have one, one query, so to speak. And you're going to have, uh, in case of SQL Server, semicolon separated five insert statements. So the advantage of that is, and that's why people have been asking for it, is network traffic. So doing, uh, uh, creating a connection, creating a command, pushing the data across the network to SQL Server. That's all involves moving electrons across the wire and none of that is free. So if you start batching, you will see a small performance boost because you're gonna reduce your network traffic and number of times you uh, potentially create commands and execute commands. So you're gonna save some time and by some time, I mean, you know, if you call it a thousand times, you may save, you know, a hundred milliseconds, but you know, every bit counts. And that's when your throughput, when Microsoft says our throughput is 500,000 calls a second, this batch size is, you know, the fact that you use entity framework will probably shrink it way down to like 10,000 calls a second right away. But every millisecond helps and maybe you end up at like a hundred, you know, 10,000 calls a second. Uh, and if you don't use batching, maybe it will be only half of that. So every little bit counts or something to, to bring up. And the other thing they put in that you used to need a package for is retry on recoverable failures. So they have that stuff built in straight into Entity Framework where you can say, if I get a recoverable failure, meaning, I don't know, like timeout. Well, timeout typically is a recoverable failure, meaning the server was too busy to respond. So they have a logic built in that will progressively step back and keep trying up to pre-configured number of retries, I'm, I'm doing a three. And the other thing I'm doing here 
is enabling no tracking, which again improves performance in entity framework. That says when you get full entities from a database and you materialize them into objects, don't track the changes. By default, track the changes because I'll assume you're going to make a change and hit save, and that has to work. You literally get an object, change property, hit save. That has to work. So in web apps, it just really doesn't happen because that you retrieve data, you push it to the browser, then you push it back, you create another context, put data back and hit save. So really you don't need to track entities as you pull them from a database. So that's what that option does. So now there is another method called configure and configure is what exposes request processing pipeline. Meaning that you have these handlers, handlers that subsequently each one gets a request and may or may do some, may or may not do something with that request and then return. So that's what the pipeline is. So in my case, first thing that is sitting in the pipeline is my logger. Next thing is my MVC, or because we're building web services, web API. Now, I don't think I need anything uh, to do with that. I don't think I need to change anything because uh, the only thing I do is use MVC. So there are a couple of configuration changes that I think I'm making. So I'll paste those in. So. I'm configuring MVC this time with a default route, which may or may not need, but it's good to have a fallback. And then the other thing that I added in here is to create my database, which I don't have right now, right? So as my app starts up, someone has to create a database because I want to pump some data into it. And this is a hack, so typically I wouldn't write that code um, in here, but for now I'm adding it in. Like technically speaking, you can do migration. So you can do code like this. What this will do as your application starts up, it's gonna say, hey, did my structure of my database change comparing to what I'm seeing right now in entity framework configuration? If so, just migrate the database. And it's super convenient and might even leave it in here, but protect it by say pound if debug. Although this works really great in dev environment, when it falls apart, if you have web farm with one database. So say two apps start up at the same time. They both gonna try to run migrations in. And mom's gonna say, hey, this table already exists and they're out. So in the real production environment, you don't want this code, but for devs, it's kind of convenient. In my case, we're probably not gonna get to migrations. So I'm gonna add code that says ensure created. I'm just gonna create the database. So I'm gonna do, all right. So this covers settings files, startup process and basic configuration and then your .NET blows up and you have to start it. But it, it restarted itself, it's weird. Okay, so it probably got upset with me making this many changes all at the same time, it happens. Any questions on what we have covered so far? All right, so let's get back and we'll do a little bit of database code. Oh, come on. So it's probably time to restart this and cross some fingers. All right, so let's see. There is something I need to do, uh, and that's probably why it's blowing up on me. There is no default constructor here. Well, there is a default constructor here, but for this to work, I need uh, a specific constructor that sets up configuration. So what is interesting that now not only my entity framework DB context is injectable, its configuration is also injected. So for that to work, I have to say, and I configured that in the startup, I said, whenever you use 
uh, DB context, use SQL Server, and use this configuration. So somehow this configuration needs to flow into my controller code. And this is how it's going to flow. I need to create a specific constructor that takes in configuration options. And all I need to do is pass it to the base class. That's all I, that's all I need to do. So I'm guessing that that's why .NET Core was getting upset with me. There's no ggmark database, so we're good to go. So now we need to create a little bit of code, and I'm going to just write one class. Um, class. And I'm going to call it person, and we're going to make it public. For a long time, I wished that default snippets in Visual Studio for class had public by default. I don't, I don't know why they don't do that. You know, a tiny gripe. So now I need to configure my entity framework. So I'm going to write one class, and for the sake of time, I'm going to have just two properties in it. Um, just ID and a name, right? So now um, I'm going to add my DB set here. If you recall, my DB set was my table abstraction. I'm going to have one table called persons, person, and I'm just going to call it persons. So at this point, I have my database abstraction. I have one my, my table with two columns. I'm good to go. Now I need to do a little bit of configuration. Somebody brought up data annotations. So I can do this. I can say required. And if I spell it right, it'll give me a little prompt. And here's those data annotations I mentioned that allow me to put validation right here. And I can say max length probably, be more descriptive. So I'm going to say the name cannot be longer than 50. So I can configure it this way. And to some extent that works, but to some extent we, I can do things like data type and say data type dot, I don't know, HTML, right? So I'm using data annotation, it's all nice and happy. And now I'm starting to slowly bleeding in my UI into my entity framework. So now I have one class and on that property I have entity framework configuration which is also used in UI validation, but I also have a UI hint that says this property contains HTML. So it kind of starts bleeding in, feels a little bit distasteful, but that could be just me. So we quickly figure out what, how we can do it via code by overriding on model creating method. And in here I can say model builder dot uh, uh, maybe apply configuration. I know you guys have a, had entity framework um, talk in here, so if I'm repeating that something that you already know, just uh, tell me. Um, this feature is kind of new, so I love this kind of code. I'm just say I'm gonna write that, and then Visual Studio is gonna create whatever Visual Studio wants to create. So in this case, it's actually picked up my base class, so it knows I need this. I need to implement specific interface. I'm gonna do that. And in here, I'm gonna use Fluent configuration this time. I'm gonna say property, and the property is called name, me, p.name. And now I'm gonna say required. I'm gonna say has max length, 50. So now I'm writing code that is very specific to Entity Framework and not specific to MVC. Now I can remove that to simplify. And now I can delete this configuration out. Or I could leave it in, so either way. So now we got our Entity Framework configured and for the most part it's working. Now this will start up. So this will actually start up my app and because in my app on my startup I have that call ensure created I'm going to cross my fingers and say I think it just created my database so if I read what it echoed out it says 
uh, come in if not exists table where table is equal whatever uh, so it was just trying to confirm to see if I have a database and if I have a specific table in it. So let me find SQL Server here. Oh. Here, I'm going to refresh my databases. And here's my GGMock database. And if all went right, I have my person with two columns. And unfortunately, it did not pick up my configuration yet because I saved in between. So I, because I saved this class without attributes, it ran in and it created it with the varchar max, which is a convention. So if I want to redo it, I have to either use migrations or I have to drop and recreate database. So maybe we'll just do that. Maybe we'll stop it. So we'll have a slightly cleaner database. So I'll go ahead and drop it. And while I'm, well, you didn't want to drop that? And while I'm doing that, <laughs> and while I'm doing that, uh, any questions? I'm assuming that there's still a wonderful ADO.NET entity builder, so that I don't have to write all the uh, classes out myself if I've got an existing database. If you have an existing database, yeah. you do have that. So if I type .NET EF, uh, I think it's DB context. Let's see if I remember that right. Yeah, okay. So go back. I misspelled something. So we're going to delete that and drop down to just EF. And it says DB context. I don't know what I misspelled. DB context. context. Yeah, close enough. It should know. And so this is your scaffold command. Okay. So if I run scaffold over here then I'll get some more options to see how I want to scaffold so I can do things like hey do you want to um, a specific project what kind of framework you want and a whole bunch of other stuff but it will create your classes for you and your DB set for you save you a little bit of time but it definitely doesn't have as many options as the old tooling used to have or the T4 templates that people wrote that did that. It definitely doesn't have as many options, but if your goal is, I just want to quickly get started, it'll get you there. And it'll scaffold all the configuration with it. So it's going to be properly configured DB context with all properly configured tables. So, me, dot net watch run. Shoot. Oh, sorry. I don't think they have all these options yet. So if you look at uh, whatever we just did. Okay, so it just created another database for me. So let me pause for one second, check that, and we'll get back to it. It's ggmark database. And this time I have var and var car max. So if we go .NET DB context scaffold help, you will see there are very few options in here actually it does have that it does have tables list for you that option is actually there but i don't think it has an option for pluralize or non-pluralize if i remember right yeah so i don't know but they said they're working on improving that so whatever, for whatever that's worth it's on the roadmap. A lot of things are on the roadmap <laughs> these days. But, like I said, the, if you think .NET Core 2.0 goal, the goal is to build most apps by most people. It'll get you there. So, is your, so if you have DB, if you have Entity Framework 6 code, would it compile? If you have configu configuration API completely changed, probably won't even compile. But, can you reverse engineer database and build a new app, sure. Yeah, you can pick up if you have database and you want to write like new project with some feature against same database. You can certainly do that. 
and if you don't want to scaffold you can ride them by hand it's not that hard and just suppress migrations because the assumption is you have other code that migrates your data that's my assumption but you can even use migrations with it as well so back to controllers so we have values controller so i'm going to create a new controller and this one we're going to call ah i didn't want to do that so there is a, some basic scaffolding in here that i personally don't like and maybe they'll they'll figure that out at some point but all i want to do is create persons persons control i think that's right uh, spelling is kind of important so now I have a public controller and I'm going to say route which is my route attribute which just tells entity frame uh, sp.net core mvc where this controller is located it used to be you have to write deaths persons right now they support some tokens inside routes so what that is that says this person's controller is going to set an API and whatever is whatever word you have in front of controller word. So this controller by this uh, substitution is going to sit at API slash persons. Now we're done with that. Now we can write a method that retrieves a list of people, for example. So let's start slow. Let's going to say I enumerable of persons get all <coughs> I feel like that's a little bit easier so first thing we know that there is no entity framework here so how do we get that so we're gonna create a constructor and we're gonna inject thing that's called context 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 and other tiny things that made its well into studio that wasn't really sharper create an initialized field context lovely thing super convenient now that we have that this is automatically going to create an instance of db context initialized with proper connection strings and then inject it here and also register it for disposition so when controller goes out of scope your db context is automatically disposed because memory leaks didn't go anywhere when you move from .NET to .NET Core. They're still there because these are still fundamentally resources that need to be disposed of. Because you don't want to leave. Because even though it's a native object, but the connection to, data, to SQL database is not. That's a SQL resource that I've been used. So we still need to do disposing proper. So, but we don't need to worry about it. It just, it just works is how it's said because it just automatically works so couple of things to think about so we can say return uh, context dot persons dot and now here's a link comes in so a little example of link say I want to order by name I can do that and I can say where uh, p dot name no p p dot name contains a, uh, whatever. A. Uh, hold on. Let's uh, collapse this for a minute. We need some more real estate over here. Oh, yeah, this looks bad. So, this sort of kind of works, except how we talked about scalability and we want to make everything async and all that. So, we probably want to do that. So, to do that, we want to make this method async and then we will await the response and the return value becomes task of i enumerable of person so now this should <coughs> compi compile almost to list async and then we just need to add this reference. Misspelling. Yeah. You just created the. the <coughs> you just created that method. 
Oh, did you go by that? Hmm? We'll see. When it does hit of 12. <laughs> <coughs> so this sort of kind of works. It violates one small convention, which is making methods a little bit more webby and uh, I action result and a little less specific. So I action result is an abstraction on top of all return values. So you think of it as what in, what in MVC and Web API used to be HTTP response message. So the new fancy name for it is I action result. And this one says, well, I don't know what that is, but that doesn't look like action result. So for example, I can say new, return new JSON result. And then, I hit enter key here. This will make it happen. So now I'm specific to return it. I'm going to we'll get data from database, convert it to JSON, and return that. Now, what, what you lose in here is knowing what it returns. And that you probably don't need as a developer, but if you want to document your web service, that becomes kind of annoying. So even in the old web API, there were tools like Swagger that could look at your code, or Swashbuckle for .NET, that would look at your code and create Swagger web page that describes your API. So in .NET Core, they build that attribute in. Right now, I think you have to reference Swagger, and the attribute lives in Swagger. But this is built into the .NET Framework. And in here, you can say, when I call this method, what would happen? And in this case, I, you return two things. You, first, you say, what is the type that is returned, and what's the success error code? So I can say type of I enumerable of person, and my success error code is 200. So now I've documented, not only for developers, I've documented that for tooling, and now you can scaffold really nice Swagger website of this code. So this is kind of, so if you go with I action result, you probably do want that for documentation purposes. So now there is another thing that is a little bit annoying. So every time you have to say new JSON result, but this will work. So before we go any further, I want to run it and see this working. So .NET watch run. And now I'm going to start Postman instead of doing the browser here. Uh, where's Postman? Where's Postman? Here it is. So Postman is HTTP app that knows how to make request responses. So it's a nice UI so you don't have to do your testing in browser because it's really hard to do post in browser, but Git works really well. But the post is really hard. So now uh, I can get persons API per, I think that's right, so we'll see. So that's actually successfully executed, as far as I know, maybe, you know. If you trust me, then it's successfully executed. But I don't even trust myself, so I'm going to add myself to this database, and I'm going to fire it one more time. And obviously, it's not working. Um, it have huh? Today that is a valid point. <laughs> How we go? How about this? Hey, so basically, back to the structure of our code. So this works, and the point I wanted to make is I didn't have to inherit from any base class. I just created a random class. And all I have to say is it lives at API persons. And since I only have one get method, I didn't even have to specify what the method name is. I just said, just, just do the thing. If I wanted to be more explicit, I would add uh, a route over here and say it lives at a blank route. And if I wanted to be even more explicit, I would add HTTP get words. 
So now I'm fully documented. So I know very explicitly a get HTTP verb invokes it and it lives at the blank ground, meaning it's API slash persons. See if this compiles. So it, it just recompiled. And if I flip back to Postman, nothing should change. Everything still works okay. All right. So if we, there is some benefits in inheriting from controller, however. And the main benefit is you can say return OK like that. Yeah. There we go. So it saves you a few keystrokes and you get those helper methods that live on controller. So OK is a response that produces 200 status code and it takes any value in there. So in my case, I'm shoving the I enumerable of uh, a person in there. So if I want to confirm, run that, nothing should change. I still get the data back. So that kind of did the get. If we wanted to get just one person, I'm just going to copy that. Now I'm going to get one person. So uh, can do get all. So get one. Now the route I need to change because I'm going to get person by ID. Now in route, I need to specify what variable that's going to be passed in on query string, not the query string, but on the URL in this case. Well, I could use query string, but on URL in this case, and I'm going to call it ID. So in this case, I need to do this. And now, okay, response type becomes a person. And then what I'm returning here, I'm going to delete all that. Uh, if I'm finding by primary key, whether composite or not, I can use find method. I'm going to delete that for a second. And you will see now that I reference that namespace, now I see a whole bunch of new methods in here, all ending with async. And async is a signal that that ex synchronous execution, meaning that request comes in, I'm extension anti framework. Now I'm going to run a query. Say the query is going to run for five seconds, right? And it's a network bound process. So if I don't do it asynchronously, I'm binding my thread that's responding to that request and forcing it to sit for five seconds and do nothing. So this is where scalability comes in. So instead of say, uh, I'm going to execute this query asynchronously and you come back to the main thread when you're done. And then you'll get a new thread from the thread pool and get uh, that thing back processed on the request thread and return the result. So now to get one, I'm using find async, which is the shortcut. I could do where, just like I did here, I could say where.pi.person ID equal equal ID, but that's a lot of work for finding my primary key. So instead I'm gonna use find async. And again, we're going to say, hopefully I created, oh, ID is one. So I'm just adding one in here and I'm doing a get and I return one person. So the result is the same, but it's not an array anymore. So if you remember, if I delete that, that was array with a person ID. One is just one person ID. So now I have another method and it's more specific. Now let's do Let's insert new data. So by convention, we're going to insert new data using a post. That's HTTP, aka REST, aka whatever you want to want to call it standard. So in this case, I'm going to say I'm going to insert, or I can just do one thing I could do. I could say post. So there is another convention. If you're using post verb, it's going to try to find one method that starts with the word post and try to execute. But because I use explicit verb in here, I can call it insert person here. And that will still work. Okay, so route, it's a blank route, right? Because route is still persons, I'm just posting some data. Now, the data that I'm posting is going to be person, right? I'm going to call it person. I, I don't know if anybody noticed that. Another resharper feature. 
see that it suggested a variable name for an ethic it's cool it's the little things right I'm the only one who thinks that's cool so. and so now now what we want to do is insert that portion right uh, and we're going to return the portion and we want to return the full thing again as the as the post standard you need to return what was created in my case I'm auto generate an identity column on the server. I have to return that. If somebody wants to immediately do edit, they don't know what the ID is. I'm going to force them to do a whole bunch of work if I don't return that. So in this case, we're going to write some new code here. We're going to say DB context, not DB context, context, eh, context. Here we go. Dot persons, dot add person and back to context.save but not save changes right there is save changes async and we want to await that not await 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 and now return ok I can actually in this case return the person and really what I want to do is not really return OK, but instead I want to say return created. And more specifically, if I want to say created at route, this is another REST standard. And of course, yeah, this will look right. Return. And the semicolon on the line before. Yep. Thank you. So created at route will insert location header. But what route was this created at? So we don't know. And the idea is that you want to put location in. Somebody can hit that location and retrieve this newly created person. That's what we're trying to do. So which route creates a por uh, returns a person by ID is this one, right? So what I want to do is name this route something. We name. And it doesn't matter what I call it. Um, should really use proper casing. Get by ID. Doesn't matter what it is. But this is the named route. And the created at route helper method takes that route name. And now it should produce a location header when I submit a portion. So now that we're testing all this, let's flip back here. Now, let's update. So we're still at API portions. This time it's going to be a post, and I really don't need to post person ID. Wait, 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 wait. Body. I don't need to post person ID. Instead, I'm going to post Jeff over here. So the idea is Jeff is about to get posted. <laughs> Just to give you a fair warning. Uh, so now what we're doing in here, I'm calling this method. So make sure we don't forget. I'm posting one person. There's one thing I want to do. I'm going to say that this actually comes from body. Because I could, in theory, sort of, if you squint, post as a query string. But I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to post this from a body. So I'm telling it, I'm going to post a person from a body. ID doesn't matter because I'm inserting. I could pass it in, it doesn't matter. But I'm not going to. Then what I'm going to do is add it to a portion table, save, and return. So I'm going to trust that that code compiled in the background properly. This will blow up because things don't work first time around. And it did indeed blow up. So we could debug that code now. So I know I'm running. And I could actually flip here, and that should give me an error as well and this says yeah somewhere no um, it went as far as the command uh, how does it know how to create the route for get by an id when you do the return created by it just looks at the named route with that name but how does it create the i the primary key it knows because they uh, I have to return that <laughs> it's true I have to return that 
I'm going to say new id equal version dot id. There we go. Thank you. Forgot about that. Uh, so I'm using just the anonymous class, and the only thing that matters is the property name, and this property name has to match that. So it's probably still not going to work, but we're going to let it recompile. I don't know what the error was here. It doesn't really say. But just in case, what I'm going to do is refresh to see if the issue was with the wrap. The issue was with the wrap, what uh, Jared pointed out. So it actually successfully executed, but it couldn't produce the result for me. So now what I'm going to do is Jeff needs a friend. Uh, and so we're going to insert him a friend, and we're going to call it just for sake of just going to pound. Just a random name. So now, oh, oh. Again, it didn't work. I wanted to show the debugging anyway, but let's see what the error was. And the handle exception, no route matches the supplied values. So it's the same error. So either it didn't compile or I have a typo. So this one has route name. Yeah. Oh, I missed yeah, the uh, opposite. Parameters. Yep. Helps to look at the help file. Anyway, we'll try it again. We need a third friend. I don't have a third friend. I'm going to put Kevin in there. Let's see if it recompiles. So it says started, so we should be good now. Boom. Okay. So if we look at the response, there should be a location header, and I can actually copy this and paste it in. And uh, uh, I need to get. Yeah, thank you and in the body it returned that portion so now we know that that created a route provides some additional resty i think that's an adjective resty functionality in there so now uh getting kind of close to nine o'clock so we're gonna try to do a put and delete and call it a night so put so in here, in the put, there are different RESTy standards. So some people say, if you don't do this, you're like a terrible person. You're going to die a horrible death. <laughs> right? Like literally, if you read that. And it's, it's in that very small font. But it's definitely there. And if so, you need to do this. And then, if so, then you can say, if id not equal to person dot person id then throw no or you know read uh, return not found i don't know some some result or you know invalid re invalid request or whatever so I, I, it, it sounds like a fun code to write and then you say why All right so i'm not gonna write <laughs> and as long as nobody sells me out to rest police, I think I'll be okay. So I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to say update person. E. Again, the method name doesn't matter. But the response time is really I don't need, right? So rest standard says put should return no content. Again, rest police. <laughs> so if we want to do that, then we can just say uh, status code, something like this, as soon as I spell it right. Uh, and, uh, okay, in status code, so we can do that. So created is 201, I think, I don't remember. Uh, I think it's 201. <coughs> so we're going to do update. Oh, it's update. I don't remember. Is it 204? 201? Uh, at least I'm not the only one who doesn't remember. 
It makes me feel better. So, because you can always do HTTP status code, and I could HTTP HTTP status, and of course it's not going to show up. Status code. Oh, system.net. It's in here, and this is going to be updated. You can do uh, you can do no content. So I think by default you can say no content, and of course it's going to say. Oh, you're giving me an enum instead of a, a thing, so wanna this if we wanted to be more explicit, we could do that. Why there is no overload on producer response types that's using actually HTTP status code, that's a whole different question. But you know, we're not gonna question Microsoft, they're really much smarter uh, than I am. So uh, and of course there is I don't need to produce response type because I'm gonna return no content no content and like that because no content there's no content so I'm passing so this will produce the accurate no content response type so now I'm doing an add and it used to be you would have to do attach and then you can say context dot uh, state is a set no, context dot anti entry person dot state equal to entity state dot modify. It's a little bit verbose, and if you submit say person and collection of phones inside there. It presents even a bigger problem because now you have to go through all of those, flag them as modified. So, luckily for us, context dot update person. So this magic update method says, I'm going to take your entity. I'm going to assume everything changed, including all the child objects. I'm just going to update all. Super magic method saves you like a ton of code. So uh, outside of that, it's all the same. We're gonna update it. We're gonna flip back to Postman. We're gonna update Kevin. And we're gonna do put because we're not afraid of magic police. I mean, uh, rest police. We're gonna just copy that in here. And we're gonna update Kevin and give him a, a last name because we love Kevin. And so now, if I did everything right, no content. So the question really is, did it get updated? So we're gonna go to four and indeed got updated. Hmm? Yeah, I did. Hey. And that was much rejoicing. So we're going to wrap up this wonderful evening with a delete. So I'm pretty sure delete supposed to return no content as well. We're going to find that out soon. So uh, if we follow rest your rules, then we're going to say we're going to pass in an ID. And we're going to use the route ID and we're going to delete from body. And instead, we're going to do int ID. So now we need to delete. So we could do this. We could say context dot uh, uh, persons dot find ID. Uh, and then we're going to say uh, context dot entry. <coughs> Like so, the state equal to deleted. We can do that. That's one way of doing it. So the unfortunate part of this approach is that in order to delete, you have to do a query first. So the unfortunate part of that is that the query operation in all database engines is actually much slower than the delete operation. So we really don't want to do that. 
because that would be super irritating for all of our users and for our best friend DBA. And we love our DBAs. Fine, I love my DBAs. Jesus. <laughs> Person ID equal ID. So this is a, a nifty trick. So we're creating a person from thin air. We're not populating any properties except ID. And because we're bypassing things like add and set property and all that, validation is not going to kick in. Because we just say, hey, don't worry about it. Just start tracking this entity as deleted. You don't need to validate anything. So we kind of trick an entity framework into more effective way of doing things. And this is it. So even though I have validation on a name that says name is required, it'll never kick in. So now if we flip back to Postman and Kevin's life in our database is about to come to an abrupt end. So we got to fire and delete. It's the same URL. Uh, and there is no body. So make sure I'm not tricking anybody. I'm deleting the body. And I'm going to do send. 404 not found. Did we compile? Uh, maybe. Oh. Okay. So we're gonna first of all make sure I saved the class. I did. By your attributes. Put. Thank you. HTTP. Delete. Start this back. Back up. Ah, I think this is still good. Kevin is patiently sitting <laughs> on the death row right now. <laughs> uh, let's assume it started back up. Ah, no content. So now if we're going to go switch back to a get and get all. Unfortunately for Kevin, he's no longer with us in this specific database. <laughs> Anywho, so that's probably need to wrap up because it's kind of nine o'clock. <laughs> so uh, to summarize, what did we do today? So we built a web service that is storing and retrieving data in a SQL Server database that we could deploy on Windows Server plug it into IIS, have it work, or we can build a package and deploy it to Linux and have it work there as well, both running with Kestrel web server. As long as there is a connection to SQL Server database that you can reach from Linux, that will still work. But you can, right now, there is even a preview of SQL Server on Linux, so you can even install the engine on Linux as well. Or you can use things like uh, database services in the cloud, everybody supports it now. So Azure has SQL Server in the cloud, so does Amazon. Uh, because Entity Framework supports multiple providers, you can pick the database of your flavor, but you'll write the exact same code. There's no difference. So you can change the configuration and run against MySQL right now with no coding changes other than configuration, just configuration change. And we implemented in a rusty way, the best we could, uh, your basic four main HTTP verbs that manipulate data in our database. We went through configuration, things like connection string, a request processing pipeline, custom services. We created database abstraction with POCO classes, separate configuration. Um, so there are things we obviously didn't do because kind of ran out of time. So like business object, we could have implemented true business object, map those to a, uh, entity framework and have a little bit cleaner code <coughs> that way where we abstract our APIs from the database, which right now they're one and the same. That leads to potential problems. All right, so any questions? Yes. Uh, that particular example we uh, ran on IIS, uh, does Microsoft support running containers like Docker? 
Uh, yeah. So because you can deploy this app into a Docker container, uh, and you can actually use Windows container or Linux container, and you can do it. So it's not really a Microsoft thing per se, because technically speaking, you can deploy current MVC app into a Windows container. Uh, I don't know what performance you're going to get. I know that we haven't tried that, so I cannot speak from experience. But technically speaking, any app could be containerized. So that's too broad of a statement. But most apps could be containerized. And they will still work through, win through Windows containers. Not, not on Linux containers. Well, Windows container will work uh, for sure with most current web apps. Right. But as soon as like, I already have the database and um, with all the tables, but I'm going to out, out of the table. Just doing to uncall and add two more columns. But I already have the data. Yeah. Right? So does it mean that it can override and just clean all the data? Depending how you write the code. So if you want to do that, you have to either do the work yourself, or you have to employ migration. So we got to really create migration right quick. So if we want, people want to see migrations because they're super excited. Me, me, <laughs> come on. Let's try it again. There we go. Dot net ef migrations at initial. Let's see if that works. The impromptu demos really never work. So I'm just trying to reset the expectation as low as humanly possible. <laughs> so if uh, by some miracle I succeed, I think we'll be all excited. So let's see what's going to happen. Uh, add an implementation. Uh, yeah. So there's some additional configuration that needs to happen. We can actually go here. Uh, go to microsoft.com f link 851278. You can actually copy the code in uh, in uh, entity framework DB context. I have to add some additional code. Um, and let's see. All right, so let's try. Luckily for us, we have internet and source of all wisdom, Stack Overflow. Well, we can do that. That'll actually give us the exact code we need to put in. And I think it'll actually have this exact error here. Dependency injection, we did all that. And run app, and there's no migration in here, because that'll be just too easy. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so it actually has the code, but it doesn't say that specific error. Uh, so we can do this. As I mentioned, the um, Stack Overflow is going to be our friend. So I bet you this time the first hit is going to be from Stack Overflow. Let's see if I'm right. Mm. Darn it, it's GitHub. And this should give us an answer, which is right, oh, right here. But I think there's another workaround, uh, entity framework core.design. I think this is the one that may be I proved myself a liar, but at least I said that it probably won't work. So. Uh, basically, if that did work, so we have our initial migration. At that point, we can add the property to um, db context. And hold on one second. 
in just like one second to see if we can fix that quickly through some magic code. Yeah, I have to be context options. So ordinarily you need this, but I added that and that thing still doesn't quite work. So uh, I wish I knew what changed, but that, that, that worked on my box fairly recently. So I'm just going to walk through the code. So if that works, I would create a migrations folder over here and we'll do an initial database view in there. It's called, 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 it's called uh, snapshot, I think. And then what you do, you add um, changes to your code. In my case, I would add a property to a person called, I don't know, int age, something like that. And then I would run migrations again. I would say, uh, add migration, add age, whatever name I want to use. And at that point, I can go and run this code either in the startup and dev environment or I can do a utility that will do the same thing. So reference your all of your models, but all it needs to do is execute database.migrate. That will apply all of your migration and will preserve your data. Um, so I wish I could demo that, but unfortunately my Googling is, is majorly failing over here. Uh, and it, I don't know why. And uh, it actually, it's some documented problems. But it doesn't say what it is that I need to do. So we're not going to spend like a ton of time on it. Maybe we need another talk on entity framework migration at some, some point. Sorry, I wish I could demo. I was I did some finger waving, so I think that was pretty similar to running code. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.